God, we pray right now that you would do a mighty work in and through the people of Hillside Community Church. We pray that we would be your disciples. Right now, out of 1 Peter, I pray that your grace and peace would be abundant wherever anyone is at. May we rise up as your followers and live radically in these days. May your word come alive as we open it up today and may you transform us and change us so people mistake us for you. I ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome everyone, I'm Woody Morwood. I'm one of the campus pastors here at Hillside Community Church and I am so excited that you're here. We got a little bit of a fun surprise for you as we get ready to conclude this series out of 1 Peter, World Gone Wild. It's been almost 12 weeks. There's been a, a wide range of just spot-on sermons and I don't know if Pastor Aaron realized it or not, but when he chose the title, when God began to lead him towards 1 Peter, that this would be so relevant for everything that we're going through right now. There's a lot of about suffering. There's a lot about the church being faithful. There's a lot about grace and peace uh, being a reality, even when everything around us seems out of control. We thought what we could do today that would be really just kind of a reminder of how faithful God's scripture is and how it shapes us is we wanted to do a rewind video. And what we wanted to do is put some of the scripture or some of the quotes. You'll get to hear from Aaron. You'll get to hear from Holly and Jeff and myself that in some ways over the next four minutes, we want this rewind video to inspire you to keep living faithfully. Uh, right now, if you're on the chats or you feel like typing something in, the title is World Gone Wild. But I've been thinking about other titles that also hint at what happens in there, like Disciples Living Faithfully. Maybe there's different things that you remember from this uh, whole series that you could put in or type in there. But I hope this video will remind you of what God is calling us to. Watch this video. could not have ever imagined this time in my whole life. We're living in what feels like a world gone wild. Like how do we see this season of life that is so unique and so difficult? How do we see with faith? As I go through 1 Peter, I'm just reminded again and again, in the midst of trying times, Peter is writing this letter to people in churches in the midst of trying times. And in fact, in some ways, Peter is preparing them for something they didn't even know. And whether that moment is financial, whether it's a spiritual challenge, an emotional challenge, I, I believe with everything in me that God can meet us in those moments and do a deep, deep work in us that refines us, that helps then define us. Right now I'm in the worship center in this empty room because I wanted to say it emphatically with you. This building is not the church, you're the church. We are the church. And what our number one role is, is to declare. This is a season when we can pray on behalf of others, that we can really be somebody that goes to God on behalf of those that are struggling. For years, I had feared the reality of a future without one of our kiddos. My mind was consistently flooded with the, but what about tomorrow? But what if next year it looks different? But what if I don't see this? And I felt like God just really challenged me on that to say, but you have this moment. Are you gonna miss this moment? And I had to choose not to miss the blessing of this moment. God is in control of who is in control. God is in control of who is in control. God is sovereign. And that's one of the most sustaining things you and I could ever hold on to. There's a difference Peter's trying to help us understand in an identity that we're given, an identity that we receive versus an identity that, that we aspire to or we achieve. And so many of us try to build our lives and our identity on, look at me and look at what I've done. And Peter's saying that's not the posture of a Christian. We are both standing 
because you're a God who stands for righteousness, you stand for justice, you're a God who says, cast your anxiety on me, and, and it's with a reminder because you care for us. So we stand saying, come Holy Spirit, heal our land, heal our hearts, and heal our homes. And we also just desperately call out to you, God, for reconciliation in our land. Above everything else, love each other. Like if you are calling yourself a follower of Christ, if I'm calling myself a follower of Christ, and we know that we have God's love, we believe we've received God's amazing grace, the tangible expression of whether or not we're living in God's love and God's grace is our love for each other. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What it's saying here is every day matters. Teach us to make every day matter, that we'll grow in wisdom of what it means to do to live out the gospel, that is the good news that Jesus died and rose again to reconcile all of humanity to God, that we would live in light of that every single day because the end of our days define what we do with our days. This series in First Peter has been powerful. It has given us words and directions from above, from God, to live radically different. And today I get the privilege of wrapping up the series and spending some time in 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, If you have a Bible or a tablet, open it up because we're going to want to look at some of these key verses. We won't talk about all of them, but eventually I'm hoping you might even read chapter 5 on your own this week and allow it to shape how you live daily and hourly throughout this entire week to come. One of the things I want to highlight is two words, grace and peace. Uh, You've heard it in a bunch of different sermons. You've seen it in the middle of 1 Peter at the beginning and at the end. It shapes everything. God's grace and God's peace shape how we can live in this season. But what another theme that comes up that I want to start with today that will really provide some context for what we're going to jump into is a theme called suffering. Um, There's about five different times in 1 Peter that it's highlighted. There's about seven different times that there's a section in 1 Peter where it kind of describes it. And and I want to even broaden the language and say crisis because I think you and I today can identify with both suffering and crisis. Maybe different than those that originally heard this letter scattered all across Asia Minor, but they knew suffering because of persecution. They were scattered because uh, the government and other people were after them. They were not for Christians. The season we find ourselves in has a whole different kind of suffering and crisis related to a pandemic, related to some just national challenges around racism and other things that we're trying to see one another and figure out new ways forward. But both can begin to feel really heavy on our hearts and our souls and our minds. I've heard two words put together this week and the words are crisis fatigue where you turn on the news or you watch anything or you talk to anybody, just that heaviness of all that is going on right now. First, Peter has suffering and crisis. We may not have the same level of persecution, but we have a a direct, indirect suffering and crisis that we're navigating. And I've really been trying to think through as I prepared for today what it looks like for you and I to respond. Uh, I thought of some uh, great psychology responses, and even better yet, I'm going to call them survival tips to respond. Uh, I love the outdoors, so I'm often in places that need bear spray, or uh, if I'm a spot where I'm surfing, uh, imagining or thinking about great white sharks, um, I want to use some of that thinking as well as some great psychology response to uh, danger, to uh, our comfort levels being diminished, to fear And there are two ways that a lot of times you and I naturally respond. One is fight, and the other one is flight. There are some times that when something happens, we dig our heels in, and we become more adamant, stronger. We get ready to swing our arms, do anything we can to survive a fight. And there are other moments that we want to flee or flight, and uh, sometimes maybe even 
play dead. I always imagined if a giant grizzly bear ever came my direction, would I attempt laying down and playing dead while it just batted me around? I don't know. But sometimes in crisis moments, you and I don't know what else to do. Do you know today, I want to suggest, or better yet, I think God's word suggests a third way. Hey, if you're one of those people that are really good and love to chat, maybe, maybe in there you'll say whether you are fight or flight. Uh, and maybe you won't because you don't want to tell on yourself. But we had one person in our last gathering respond, and it was so interesting because they said, I tend to be a fighter verbally and a flight, I'm sorry, a fighter verbally and a flighter physically. Huh. Verbally on text messages or posting, but in person, calm and mellow and passive, they actually were saying there's a little bit of both in them. But I want you to think of a third way. I already hinted that there is a third way in 1 Peter. And if you want to type in or give us some response or feedback, what do you think the third way in 1 Peter might be? If it's not fight, if it's not flight, what would God's word call us to? I'll give you a hint and then I'll tell you what it is. It's something that we do when we first have our proper place before God. And, and then it's when we have a proper understanding of ourselves. And then it's how we interact with one another. Do you know scripture calls us to a third way? And it's to be humble. Not fight, not flight, but to be fully present, fully engaged in a humble way. If we jump into 1 Peter and kind of look at some of the language that's in there, the first verse is this elder, which is Peter calling out other mature believers, other elders, and he basically says to them that he appeals to them. He wants them to live radically different. And he says, as witnesses of Christ's suffering and one who is also will share in the glory revealed. We do have this grace and peace theme all the way through 1 Peter, but we also have this suffering and crisis theme. And the very first thing in chapter 5 that Peter says to us, to all those that would read this and hear this and look at this, is there is the reality of suffering, but there is also the reality that God's glory will be revealed. What we see, what we experience, the world undone, the world gone wild is not the ultimate reality. You and I can live humbly in a very different way when we know God has a different outcome. There may be hints of that today, tomorrow, this week, but ultimately when God comes back and redeems, reconciles, and saves us, everything will be for his glory. So I can give you a little bit of great news today. Uh, this will not last forever. Uh, the bummer is, I'll try to practice being humble here, I don't know how long our discomfort, our suffering, our crisis will last. But I do know it will end because Jesus will make all things right. And some of us today might even pray, come Lord Jesus, come. Sooner rather than later, do something. But until that time, you and I are radically being called out to live very specifically in this season. Again, if you got your Bible open or a tablet open, look at uh, chapter 5, verses 2 to 3. Here's what it says. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. I love the language here in these uh, first uh, two verses, two and three of this whole new section, and the emphasis is Humble shepherds. If I had to give you a title today that I hope will stick or pop up in your mind later in this week, it would be this. Humility head to toe. Humility in every corner, crevice, every part of who we are being lived out because we know who God is and who God wants to be in our lives and now how we can have that flow out of us. But in this particular spot, it's focused on humble shepherds. Notice here the word leader isn't used. Notice that this isn't like just for professional, full-time, vocational pastors. This is for any Christ follower that is mature and leading. Uh, I was reading this passage and thinking of the context of this uh, entire 1 Peter letter. It was written to the Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor. There was probably never more than somewhere between 10, 12, 15 people 
in a house church. Uh, they were gathered together, uh, young and old. Uh, there was male and female. And could you imagine when the reading of this letter might have happened? They're probably sitting there going, wait a second, who's under my flock? Who's in my span of care? How do I have right motives? How do I serve? How do I humbly be the shepherd that Jesus has been to me? If you remember some of the preaching out of chapter 2, there was language of chief cornerstone so that we would be living stones. In this one, if you go on and read a little bit of verse 5, it talks about, I'm sorry, verse 4, it talks about the chief shepherd and we are now under shepherds or we are like shepherds in training. I hope in your watch parties, I hope in your neighborhood, I hope in your homes, God has given you wisdom how to humbly watch over the flock that is under your care. Right now, nothing's normal. We're, we're not together frequently. Uh, we're, not even, we're not even together very, just like, often at all. And right now, you've got to think about who has God placed in your span of care. At your job, who's on that Zoom? Uh, in your family unit, what's it like during this pandemic and the crisis we go through for you to be a humble shepherd? It could be life-changing. I've thought of other crises, other seasons of life that have been kind of uh, really challenging in these days. And uh, one of the ones had a huge impact on me. Uh, it was a national, just news focus moment. It was 1979, November, and uh, the world was not black and white TV. But if you see this photo and you weren't alive back then, just know we didn't have color everywhere. And uh, we needed color TVs, but you're going to see black and white photos at the embassy in Iran. There were those that wanted revolution, and so they took over the embassy, and 52 Americans were taken hostage, and they were held for 444 days, almost two years, from November to two years later in January. And what was so powerful about this story is that it really had a personal connection and a shaping point in my life as a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 12-year-old. What happened was our pastor's son was actually in the embassy, was actually being held hostage for those two years. And I got to watch a humble shepherd lead in a moment of crisis. What's even more powerful is we had news agencies. We had news anchors at our church all the time. The pastor had all these interviews in his home. And one of them was by the name of Janine Tartaglia, up and coming news anchor. She was interviewing presidents. She was on the Tonight Show. She was on the Today Show. She was everywhere. And all of a sudden she finds herself in a church in a national crisis watching a pastor who was humble living for God. This Janine Tartaglia up and coming anchor woman actually ended up becoming a humble shepherd. God worked in her heart. She accepted Christ. She left the news agency. She left being an anchor. And when she came to the pastor who had had such an impact on her life and asked, what could I do? I'm sure she was sitting there thinking, go, I could speak. I would do full time in front of cameras. I'm ready to lead and do everything. And the pastor looked at her and go, I want you to watch out for those that are shut in. Those that are elderly that can't shop. Those that have had strokes that can't talk. I want you to learn how to clean bedpans. That is the shepherding ministry you could do. Janine Tartaglia did that for years and grew into a role of ministry and pastoring that I got to watch and was modeled for me of what it means to be a humble shepherd. Do you know during this time of crisis, during this time of suffering, because of that story and the stories I'm hearing from you and seeing a part of our church, what is God doing to prepare and transform our church to be something more? I want to invite you to something. Do you know we have an equipping class for the next three months? It's one class on a Wednesday night for an hour and a half, one for each month, both in July, August, and September. And what we want to do is we want to train you. We want to equip you. We want to get you ready to be a humble shepherd. The first class will be about who is God. The second one will be about spiritual growth. And the third one will be about growing in community. And what does it look like to take on spiritual leadership or what I would call shepherding? We're hoping that in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a crisis in our nation or around racism and heartbreak, that we will be a church that learns to grow in the most active way possible. Open up your Bibles again. i got to keep going because there is so much great stuff in here. If we look at verse 5, there's this language about those of us that are younger looking to our elders. 
I got to tell you something. I am 49 years young and I got a lot of energy, but there is a lot of wisdom I still need in my life. And right now in this season that we find ourselves in, I'm trying to submit, I'm trying to be humble and I'm trying to learn and listen. And so anyone that has more life experience, more uh, scenarios of being faithful, here's what I'm doing. I'm going up to them and I'm saying, hey, tell me, have you ever seen anything like this before? The second question I ask, and I listen intently because these are people that I've watched be absolutely faithful in following God during this difficult time. I say to them, how did you see God work then, and how do you hope God will work now? Do you see what 1 Peter's doing for us with grace and peace and suffering and crisis? We believe that God wants us to actively be ready for what God is up to in this time and place. It's not fight. It's not flight. It's enter into it with a humble spirit that only God can do in us because he's changed us. Listen to this language out of 1 Peter 5, uh, verse 5, and it's kind of that section, uh, second part B. It says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. There's a really powerful spot right there where it says God opposes the proud. Uh, This passage, chapter 5, talks a lot about what God is for, but what God is not for, what God opposes, is the arrogant. We're in a season right now where there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of strong opinions about all kinds of things. I guess that's what a, a, a crisis or suffering or a pandemic or the world turned upside down feels like. But I want to tell you this with that humble language when it says, clothe yourselves in humility. I would love to call you, call me, the people of Hillside Churches to something. And it's this. I believe humility in this time could be the most daring and risky way to live. The most powerful way to live. The way that God wants to use to do something in our world, in our communities, and in our homes. Could you imagine being in your home or at a watch party and being a humble servant? Grandparents, kids, adults, anybody pouring into anybody. And through this season, being there more for somebody else than you are for yourself. We've already heard it. Submit ourselves, humble ourselves to our mentors, our leaders. Learn from them. Be humble to one another. And then ultimately be humble to God because God opposes the proud. I've been thinking through this a little bit and one of the passages I thought of was the example that Jesus was humble and set the example for us like no other. It was Jesus' humility that allowed for the cross to save you and I. Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus raising from the dead only happened because of what we know in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. It says this, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made into human likeness. If you're brand new to this Jesus thing, if you're brand new to Christianity and you're watching this and thinking about it, can I give you the most encouraging thought in the world? Our Savior humbled himself from being God in order to die on a cross so that we could be forgiven our sins. That is the example that we have. I've been thinking of some books and some titles, and there's an author by the name of Yoder that that has a book that's called The Politics of Jesus. And in it, the focus is all the gospel according to Luke. If you and I want to know how to live right now, just read the Beatitudes. Uh, Just learn and watch what Jesus does. I was in a meeting where we were talking about this and somebody said this, trust the way of Jesus. Trust the way of Jesus. It's not this. It's not about being right. It's not about being the loudest. It's about serving, loving, and being humble in God. This passage that I just read out of verse 5 actually is hinting back to Proverbs Chapter 3, verse 34, where it basically says, God mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. And if you remember Proverbs chapter 3, verse 2, guess what? In that passage, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And what I would love to say, and he will direct your path in such a powerful, humble way 
that God will show you how to have an impact. I heard a quote this week that was powerful as we're thinking through all these different dynamics in our world right now. Brian Loritz said, don't let CNN, Fox News, or MSNBC disciple you. I might even add in there TMZ or any other thing that you can think of. What would it be like if we were in the scriptures and God, the example of Jesus in this passage out of chapter 5, teaches us how to be humble with one another? You heard one other word in there. It was called clothed. Clothe yourself in humility. I've been reading a bunch of different people this week, and one of them was talking about, shouldn't the uniform of the church be humility? If we were to all wear a company shirt or an outfit, or somebody even said to me, or even a onesie because we're all home all the time, what if we had the onesie of humility and people knew us and our church by how we live? I want to paint an image for you. It's a prophetic image. Um, And it's very different than the images you and I have been seeing on TV lately. I have examples, and I won't be specific, but uh, ones where someone's yelling at people because they're not yelling a mask, and somebody else is yelling because they don't want to wear a mask. This imagery here is so different. It's not fight. It's not flight. It is humility in God. And it's out of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 through 9, and it's a powerful call to who we can be in this world right here, right now, says this, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah was projecting forward, was hinting at Jesus from the root of Jesse, that when Jesus defines who we are, when we are clothed in humility as a church, that type of peaceable kingdom is possible. There's a painting by Edward Hicks, and it shows this uh, lion and lamb and ox and cow and a uh, little child and viper's nest. It seems impossible, but this is the peaceable kingdom when we live humbly with one another. This painting he painted over 62 different times. And uh, he might have been a perfectionist, but I want to throw out another possibility. Maybe he painted it 62 different times because in his own life there were 62 different moments that either he wasn't living it or the world around him wasn't living it. Hillside Community Church, around the world, what would it look like if we were the humble examples of a Christ who died on the cross for us as we die for others? I have something I want you to do as... Ah, not homework, but as good old-fashioned discipleship. This week, I would love to beg you to take this passage and read chapter 5, because there's even more information in there about casting your cares on God. There's more information about resist the devil and call out the things that are the devil so you know what you're working and praying against and you got his help for. But I would love for you to take chapter 5, and I would love to invite you somewhere this week to get on your knees in a humble posture where you know you need God. And when you get in that posture to read chapter five and begin to pray over all the things that you know you need God's help to live out, to watch over a flock, to be humble with God, humble with each other, and to find a radical way to live in this season and time through conversations around racism and disagreements and trying to find new ways forward and how we live this in a peaceable kingdom where really the lion does not devour or anyone does not ruin or destroy, including myself. Part of the reason I'm on my knees right now is because I have to look up. I have to look up to God and I have to humbly be willing to look up at others. And I think what this passage could do for us, if you pray it on your knees, chapter five, read it and pray it this week. It can help get you ready for the new series we're gonna move into next week. A recipe around community, a mixture of what it looks like for you and I to do life together in the mix. 
it begins with stuff like this. I want to pray a benediction, a doxology over Hillside Community Churches and all churches. Out of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says this. And the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Church, my hope and prayer is that you and I will learn to live the peaceable kingdom. My hope and prayer is that you'll be able to sing in a new way and live in a new way where it's not about fight, it's not about flight, it's about being humble. And that in that, that grace and peace will drive us to be a church we could have never imagined ourselves to be. And people would find themselves shepherding, leading, and being transformed in ways they never thought. God's grace and peace to you as you live this out. Amen.